I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. This is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast where we have a seance, because this week we watched The Unquiet Dead. Written by Mark Gatiss. Directed by Euros Lin. I'm not sure if it's Euros or Euros, but I'm going to go with Euros, (laughs) and we're just going to pretend like it's correct. Again, (laughs) and aired on April 9th, 2005. Yes, I'm... The first story of the reboot not written by Russell T. And the third story of the reboot. <laughs> and the first written by Mark Gatiss. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess just further proving that thing that like writers only have like five stories to tell because this was really similar to Last of the Gadarene. Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair in this situation, how many people watching this have read Lost of the Gathering <laughs> besides us? <laughs> I mean, still, that's that's sort of like a thing that people say, like, yeah, writers only have five stories max that they can tell. And it's, it's just a new coat of paint every time. Yeah, I, guess, I mean, I guess. It's pretty much true. It's pretty much true. <laughs> pretty much true, but not always. Uh, so this is also the closest thing that the Ninth Doctor gets to a Christmas special because it's set on Christmas Eve and the very first Christmas special of the reboot was David Tennant's first episode as the Doctor, so yeah. So I guess this is it. I guess this is as close as you're going to get, which isn't really close because it has pretty much nothing to do with Christmas. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, Christmas is just like a a tangent to the story that the Doctor mentions, like, oh yeah, it's Christmas. It's just it's just like real life, just something that happens in the background that you don't really care about. I mean, unless you're Christian or Catholic. Or like five years old. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Some people still celebrate Christmas when they're older because it's a, an excuse to get the family together again. And an excuse to get free stuff. And an That's excuse to eat for. all day. <laughs> So, it begins with a corpse rising from the dead yeah, so to strangle a dude. Th- they're in a, a morgue or something, and um, some guy is crying over his dead grandmother, and uh, the mortician, I guess, is... Yeah, the undertaker. Yeah, undertaker. He's there. And, uh, Sneed. <laughs> yeah, Sneed. He, he leaves for a second, and the grandma comes, or wakes up, I guess... And starts strangling the grandson, and Sneed's like, oh, not another one. Yeah, and then he, she kills the yeah, grandson, she kills Mr. Redpath. Uh, <laughs> you hear the neck snap. I'm certain about that this time, because I heard it. And All right, when were you not certain about it? Uh, in one of those audios we listened huh, to. Uh, all right, well, I mean, yeah, it's kind of harder to tell in an audio, usually, I guess. Yeah, so kind of a... Oh, it might have been Master... Yeah, I think it was Master. Yeah, it was. With uh, Victor and his wife. Anyway, yeah, kind of a really sucky way to go for Mr. Redpath. You're killed by his own grandmother, <laughs> killed who's by already your dead. dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go. No, no, it's, it's can, really not. Can you imagine writing that on the death certificate? Cause of death, strangulation by dead grandmother. <clears throat> No, it was dead before she strangled him, not after. Anyway, so Sneed's like, well, guess we have another body. Good thing we're in the morgue already. We don't have to take the body anywhere. Just throw him in another coffin and bury him. Oh, jeez. Somebody call him or... Oh, wait! <laughs> and then we cut to the doctor and Rose in the TARDIS. Yeah, the doctor is using the sonic screwdriver for an unknown purpose. So bringing (laughs) back that unknown purpose use of it that they always put into the classic show. Yeah, I was looking at our sonic screwdriver page and I'm pretty sure unknown purpose is the one that has the most appearances. (laughs) Reminder that the sonic screwdriver page exists on our website where we keep track of all the dumb things the sonic (laughs) screwdriver does. And he's working... Could have made a fantastic count for the Ninth Doctor, but I guess it's too late now. (laughs) Oh, well. Darn. Well, he's only said it like four times, so if we really wanted to, we could. But anyway, the Doctor's underneath the console. Pretty sure this is the only time we ever see him underneath this console. Remember seeing him underneath the later console rooms in the reboot a lot, but not this one, so... Huh. Well, he never did it in the original series. 
So. Yeah, because you couldn't, because it was a hard floor <laughs> of the studio that the BBC was filming in. So Rose is like, where are we going? And the doc's like, we're going to 1860. We're going to find out what happened. I just chose that year because it sounds cool. Yeah, and they're going to Naples, Italy. Or they're trying to. Yeah, trying to. They miss by a couple thousand miles and a couple of years. Yeah. So, so um, Rose is about to leave the TARDIS and the doctor's like, no, no, you can't go out with those clothes. You got to change and fit in. So she changes. But pretty sure what she changes into would be more... <laughs> Um, would stand out more Be based more on her bare shoulders and cleavage in 1860. Pretty sure you couldn't walk around like that in 1860, or I suppose 69. Well, <laughs> 69. Gwyneth thinks that she's like a noble woman, I guess, when they're talking later, but then Gwyneth just reads her mind and finds out <laughs> that's wrong. But anyway, we're not there yet. The doctor, Rose tells the doctor also to change, and the doctor's like, I changed my jumper. I kind yeah. of don't think people wore leather jackets in 1869 either. That might stand no, well, out quite a bit. You'd be wrong about that. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, weird thing is the doctor tells, Ro- obviously just just a joke or a quote-unquote joke, because this episode was honestly a lot less funny than the Russell T. Davies ones. So thanks, Mark. <laughs> this episode was a lot more mediocre than the Russell T. ones too. Yeah. It was. <clears throat> anyway, the doctor tells Rose, he gives her complicated directions about how to get to the wardrobe room, and maybe this was just me, but I always kind of just imagined that that wardrobe room is just, like, right there, like, kind of just right in the first hallway, like, first door on the right. Well, so, in the classic series, it always seemed like every time the doctor went through that door in the console room, <laughs> he ended up in a different room, so I always thought maybe the console, not the console, the TARDIS was slightly psychic in that it knew what room you wanted to go to and just swapped out yeah, what probably. room was on the other side of that door. But now, apparently, the TARDIS has corridors. uh, Really long corridors, apparently. Or maybe it just decided to be a complete jerk and and be psychic, but give you the room you don't want. Or maybe it's just broken. (laughs) Yeah, it probably is. Or the Doctor is just not uh, able to to get to his planned destination again. Because they wind up in Cardiff, 1869. Nice. We forgot to mention last week the TARDIS translation circuits where they finally explain why everybody speaks English in every story ever. Yeah. Yeah, last week it was revealed that the TARDIS has like some sort of psychic uh, connection to the people who travel in the TARDIS and then it just translates what everybody's saying into a language they understand, which also has the added implication that the, the Doctor might not be speaking English either, and he might be being translated for the benefit of the companions. But that's a whole different theory. It's probably <clears throat> not true, based on how much of an earthophile he is, I guess. <laughs> an earthophile. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so they're in kind of... like all Charles Dickens' books... Well, he's also lived for like 900 years, so he's had a lot of time. <laughs> time. Yeah, anyway. but reading is boring as hell, so... The Doctor and Rose go out of the TARDIS. Meanwhile, Sneed and his... Maid? Maid? Servant. <laughs> Servant. Uh, Gwyneth. They're out looking for bodies. Yeah, they're like, oh god, we have to find, um, what's-her-face. And it's sort of implied here, or hinted at, um... That Gwyneth is can, well, not that she can read minds, but that she has some sort of supernatural ability. You can't really tell what yet. Yeah, they call it the sight. Yeah, so she's trying to locate um, uh, Redfield or whatever her name. Red path. Red path. Red path. God. <laughs> 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 well, so turns out they didn't really need that because <laughs> she makes herself readily known. <laughs> Yeah, she apparently before she died, she was looking forward to going to a, a, an apparently free uh, yeah. <laughs> reading by Charles Dickens. Yeah, Charles Dickens is giving this performance, and he, there's a poster on the wall behind him advertising this performance. I didn't know they made up posters for performances in 1869, but I mean, how else are you going to get the info out there in 1869? Pamphlets, pamphlets, and posters, newspaper advertisements, and word of mouth. That's pretty much it. Anyway, it says free performance by Charles Dickens, so that was kind of yeah. interesting. Also, Charles makes this statement like he has no family waiting for him. He traveled alone. Which isn't true, based on the end <laughs> of this. Well, I think it's just supposed to be that he's uh, he's estranged from his yeah. family. Yeah, 
And I don't know about, I don't know too much about Charles Dickens' life, so I don't know how much of this was true. Yeah, I'm not a Dickinson expert, Dickinsonian. I'm not a Dickinsonian. Uh, All right. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but he's reading, um, what's it called? The Christmas Carol. Yeah, Christmas Carol. Or, or reciting it from memory, since he doesn't seem to be using that podium at yeah, all. I couldn't tell if there was a book on the podium or if he was just reciting it. So he's talking about the part in the book where Scrooge's knocker gets inhabited by the spirit of Scrooge's assistant. Stupid freeloading spirit. <laughs> yeah, that spirit. And as he gets there, the grandmother makes herself known by releasing this gaseous <laughs> specter thing. Yeah, and the extras they hired to sit in the crowd sort of lazily act that they're scared and kind of just stroll away. Well, I try to mask it by putting in some really rapid cuts between <laughs> Charles Dickens and the audience. No <laughs> sound effects, though, unfortunately. Well, maybe since they're going back to, to modern-day London next week, they can bring back those sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Because obviously those are actual sounds that play in modern day London. <laughs> what, you don't just walk down the road and hear people making... No, only in, only in modern day London, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. So, yeah, then everybody kind of converges on the theater. Because... Yeah. When you see people running out of a theater, you the obvious in. response has to run in. <laughs> yeah, so there's... A bunch of confusion. Uh, Sneed and Gwyneth try and take in uh, the body, the, the body, because it's sort of fainted and after releasing the spirit. But then they see that Rose has sort of caught on to what they're doing, and so <laughs> Sneed like chloroforms her. And Gwyneth is like, "What did you do that for?" <laughs> My question was. <laughs> Why does Sneed have like? <laughs> yeah, where did he? Did he just carry this around at all times? <laughs> what the hell, Sneed? <laughs> Never know when you might need this. <laughs> Maybe he's running a bit of a side business, <laughs> selling woman <laughs> or chloroform. Oh yeah, or chloroform. <laughs> no need to jump to conclusions. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, they they knock out Rose and bring bring her back to their house. Meanwhile, Dickens thinks the doctor's behind all of this, and the doctor's like, yeah, as if I have that kind of power. I mean, he is probably the most suspicious one around, because... Of that leather jacket. Oh. That, and he's the one who's the o- probably the only one around who's not scared. Besides so, I mean, Dickens. Well, yeah, but, I mean, that's Dickens super... Dickens is unfazed. Yeah, Dick, well... Yeah, I guess, because he thinks it's all just a, a joke and mm-hmm. or a trick. Um, but yeah, he and the doctor get into a, a coach or whatever, and the doctor realizes that it's, it's Charles Dickens. He's like, man, I'm such a big fan. And then <laughs> hilarious Mark Gatiss, you know, playing with the that fan and fan homonym. <laughs> no, no, it actually was just terrible. That was interesting, because I don't think... We very rarely see this show ever make light of the fact that the English language has changed. I mean, they did it in Face of Evil when they went to the future and Seva Team and Tesh. Uh, yeah, but that was sort of... Corruptions of Survey Team and that was Mission. Yeah, that was them, like, making things up, though, rather than, yeah. like, this. But, yeah, I guess it was kind of interesting in that light, but it wasn't funny. <laughs> yeah, so, well, what was funny was the Doctor gets in the coach and is like, follow that hearse and dickens is like that's not happening and the doctor's like well why not and dickens like because this is my coach it's got a point (laughs) (laughs) anyway once the doctor espouses his love of dickens dickens is like well i guess we can follow that hearse now so they do and they they go to where you would expect the hearse to go which is the morgue (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> don't know why they needed to follow the hearse also the name of Sneed's company is painted on the side of the hearse so just gotta add in that high speed 1869 chase actually no because it was probably wasn't high speed and they didn't show any chase or or uh, any 
following scene at all. Yeah, so. probably topped out at like five, maybe ten miles an hour if we're really optimistic. They're working on one horsepower. So I don't yeah, know how I mean, fast you... a horse can go pulling a carriage. I mean, horses are decently quick when they're not pulling a carriage. Yeah, but you wouldn't want a horse to like be running full <laughs> speed down the streets either. So there's that. Anyway, they show up and um, I think, well, Rose has woken up now and she's like, what the hell, guys? What the hell? Yeah, because Sneed locks her in a room with two corpses. Yeah, so this... The Red uh, Path... Yeah, family. This episode continues the trend of Rose getting locked in places and having to be saved. Yeah, but then also she continued uh, another trend for Rose. I forgot what it was. She oh, also I didn't, <laughs> I didn't mention the doctor litters. He throws a, a flyer down, and I'm like, wow, really, really making use of of your time travel abilities here. You know, most people don't get the chance to litter in 1869. <laughs> yeah, well, like you said, most people don't get the chance to litter in 1869. Yeah, so you. Just taking advantage. Yeah, exactly. I, I would do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> haven't littered yet this year. Gotta gotta make gotta make use of my time left to litter in 2017. <laughs> Can't always litter in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, how clean do you really think the streets of Cardiff in 1869 no, are? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> So the doctor rescues Rose from the reanimated corpses, and and then Rose basically tears Sneed a new one by uh, basically yelling at him and blaming him for locking you in a room with two corpses who got reanimated, and then not opening the door when Rose gets brutally assaulted by the corpses. Uh, I mean, she's right in well, all not of this. Brutally assaulted. They're sort of just lazily walking towards well, her like zombies. One of them grabs her and starts choking her when the doctor opens the door. Oh, yeah, I guess I didn't remember that. Even so. though I just watched this 30 minutes ago, but, um... <laughs> yeah, apparently she doesn't, uh, implicate Gwyneth <laughs> at all. So, yeah, well, I mean, Gwyneth kind of didn't want to go through with it anyway, but I guess she still did, so... Yeah. So the doctor's in the background smiling, because later on he says he made a good choice in picking Rose as his companion. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't mention the, the part at the beginning where the doctor's like, wow, Rose, you look beautiful. And I was like, oh, God, here we go. And then he was like, for a human. Yeah, but and she's I like, mean, wait, what does that mean? Yeah, but still, it's still just a here we go kind of moment. <laughs> yep. Yep. Get used to it. <clears throat> so anyway, they. <laughs> Dickens is in the corner like, what is this? This is all just some elaborate trick, isn't it? The doctor's just like, shut up, Charles. I think he calls uh, Dickens Charlie when they're in the cab, and he's like, nobody calls me Charlie. Yeah, and then the doctor's like, the woman do? And he's like, how do you know that? (laughs) Which is a good point. How does the doctor know that? Anyway. He's met Charles Dickens before. Yeah, he has. Oh. It's the eighth doctor, apparently, in audio. They got into an argument, apparently, (laughs) about one of Dickens' stories. Also, the doctor in the coach ride mentions that the American bit of one of Dickens' stories that he inserted later was total rubbish. And Dickens is like, hey, apparently he, Dickens actually did randomly insert a section into one of his older stories when it got published to kind of try to spruce it up. And I haven't read it, so I have no idea if it's any good or not. not yeah, I don't know which, which story it is, but I know Charles Dickens was hugely popular here. So I guess we could just look on the wiki because I know they mentioned it because I was reading it. Um Oh, Martin Chuzzlewit, that was it. That famous Dickens story. I've only read like three Charles Dickens things, I think. Christmas Carol, Great Expectations, and Tale of Two Cities. But yeah, I guess that's not important. Christmas Carol, Tale of Two Cities, and Oliver Twist. (laughs) What a twist! (laughs) Anyway, Doctor tells Charles to shut up. So, yeah, kind of third Doctor-like, I guess, but it feels more... Mm, I don't know if feels justif- more earned yeah. <laughs> I feel, yeah it feels more earned because the third doctor would always just be really abrasive and kind of a dick um, just because really it, but the ninth doctor does it in more fitting situations yeah and he so, apologizes afterwards yeah. he, he goes off to Charles like yeah I probably shouldn't have told you to shut up but in the same <laughs> but on the same token you kind of have to uh, try and accept the fact that the dead are walking the earth now <laughs> Because it's not a trick, Charles. <laughs> it's not a trick. We also forgot to mention that Gwyneth gives the doctor his tea the way he likes it, with two sugars, even though the doctor hasn't told her how he likes mm. it. Yeah, I didn't notice that, actually. And you can actually, if you watch Christopher, 
Christopher, Christopher Eccleston, he like reacts to this pretty well in my opinion because he doesn't say anything but he gives her like a really questioning look about it huh, I, I completely missed that entire <clears throat> exchange i guess <laughs> yeah because it kind of happens in the background rose says something to sneed and then you see in the background she comes over and she's like your tea with two sugars as you like it mister and he's like sorry hmm. <clears throat> interesting so I, I, that kind of explains how the doctor figures out that Gwyneth can read minds later on because without that scene it kind of looks like he just jumps to a conclusions which is pretty par for the course, so... <laughs> yeah, but it's less of a jump this time because yeah, of that, so. Yeah, No, I'm just saying, like, if you didn't <laughs> notice that scene like I did, it wouldn't be weird that he would jump to that conclusion and be right about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway... I think this is actually that scene where Gwyneth's talking with Rose about things. Oh, yeah, so Gwyneth and Rose have this sort of one-on-one scene... They're talking about, they they have, like, a surprising amount of things in common, despite being born, like, a hundred years apart. And then it's revealed that, or Gwyneth starts to read, Rose's, read mind. Rose's mind and let it slip that she knows more about Rose than what Rose has told her. Gwyneth and, also mentions Bad Wolf. Yeah. The big and, Bad Wolf. Yeah. So that one requisite mention of it, interested <laughs> to see what it is, because they keep hyping it up. Well, it I think they're the doing it for next time, too, the yeah. graffiti. The, I think they're doing it pretty well. Yeah, I do too. They're not... Well, he, Russell T uh, is kind of the, the brainchild behind it, but it, they're not really making it a big part of every story. It's just like a little reference here or there, like somebody will yeah. mention Bad Wolf. Or, like in the next story, it's graffiti on the TARDIS. So yeah, I don't just know something if, in the background. I wonder if I would have even picked up on it if I didn't know about it. I mean, maybe by the next episode of the graffiti, <clears throat> but you yeah. know, maybe, maybe not here. I don't know, because obviously I do know about it, but... We also get the info that um, Rose's dad is dead. Yeah, which is actually important because it comes up in a later story this season. It's <clears> like because, it's a because ma- of it's the a clear major... Electra complex with the Doctor. <laughs> okay, no, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a major plot point in one of the stories this season. So uh, it's nice that they introduced that early and didn't just dump it on us in that story. <laughs> Anyway, the doctor's like, yeah, well, you grew up on top of the Cardiff space-time rift, didn't you, Gwyneth? <laughs> Apparently the doctor's figured out that there's a space-time rift. Yeah. I so think- still getting in that requisite jumping to conclusions and being right thing. <laughs> I think one of the Gelf at this point has mentioned the rift, but they didn't mention a rift of what kind or where, and the doctor's just immediately put together that it's in Cardiff and it's a space-time rift. And I think that's when they hold the seance, which is, like, pretty much right now. Because, yeah, the the doctor realizes Gwyneth's ability mm-hmm. and how she's communicating with aliens. So they're like, yeah, let's hold this seance. And Charles is like, nope, nope, not doing it. Not doing it, but he does it. So Yes, yeah, so the doctor's like, Charles, sit down. We're doing the seance. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, the kind of space-time rift would be important in Torchwood because Torchwood 3 would be established above it. Mm, oh. Interesting. Yeah, I thought Charles Dickens' um, like disbelief... Because this, this story was a lot less... It was sci-fi because it was aliens and stuff, but it felt a lot less sci-fi and a lot more supernatural slash like urban fantasy mm-hmm. than, than most Doctor Who stories. So I thought it was sort of like a jab at like, well, this is what Doctor Who is now. You know, you're just going to have to accept it, just like Charles Dickens. <laughs> Gotta be Charles Dickens. Did you see on the wiki that it, it talked about this guy, Lawrence Miles, who wrote... A, a few Doctor Who stories and then eventually spun off his own faction paradox thing with some ideas no. he wrote. But anyway, apparently he wrote pretty good reviews for the first two episodes of the reboot. And then like an hour after this episode aired, he posted this long, <laughs> scathing review of this episode where he basically said that Mark Gatiss was equating like asylum seekers with evil people trying to mooch off of liberal generosity. What? And then <laughs> Mark Cadiz was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? And then apparently Lawrence Miles said later that the subtext probably wasn't intentional, but it should have been caught anyway. <laughs> when I read that, I was like, I didn't pick up on that at all. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was kind of funny. You know, I guess showing how sometimes you can find, you can totally find meaning in things where there aren't any, where there well, isn't any. Well, that's interesting. That's actually something this story brings up um, when the doctor brings up morality later, because um, there's this entire school, I guess, of like literary theory, which is like you know you you 
bring to the story like you bring your own experience to anything you read watch whatever which mm-hmm. which is pretty much true because not everyone thinks the same thing about something yeah it's not and stories aren't really an objective thing so the doctor mentions it in terms of um like morality later so that was actually kind of interesting i guess that this this guy was like clearly just bringing his own biases slash mm-hmm. opinions to the story yeah. which isn't wrong but i guess it's where he was coming from that like you you and i didn't see that and probably yeah. probably other people didn't see that <clears throat> either so there you go yeah, that scene with the Doctor and Rose actually happens right after the seance. Because in the seance, the Gelf reveal that due to the time war, roasting their physical bodies, they're just gaseous things now and they need bodies. So the Doctor's like, well, they can use the corpses on Earth. And Rose is like, no, they can't. That's wrong. And the Doctor's yeah. like, why is it wrong? And Rose can't seem to come up with any explanation for why it's wrong, except it's wrong. Yeah, Which- well, later on, she goes, it's, she says it's amoral. And the Doctor's like, well, to you, maybe, but there's different senses of morality. Yeah, the doctor's kind of arguing that the the corpses, the the people inside the corpses are dead. So the yeah. doctor says it's like recycling; they're just reusing the bodies, or like a, a donor card. Yeah. Well, like, so he brings up the donor card, and Rose is like, "That's different." And the doctor's like, "It is different. It's a different kind of morality." <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, that was kind of the the most interesting part of the story, besides the the uh, the whole language thing between dickens and yeah the there's in my I'm, opinion anyway. i'm trying to remember what it is this is kind of related to what i was talking about before but some extremely famous british writer from like the 1700s wrote this piece that's like super proto reader response theory which like 20th century writers have like really looked back to and been like yeah um and i, I think I, i'm completely blanking on who it was but the most famous line from that is that this story doesn't have a meaning but it wakens a meaning in the reader so I just wanted to bring that up, and I'll probably post it in the on the site if anyone's interested. In the show notes. Yeah. That almost sounds absurdist to me. No, it's not really. It's really not. <laughs> it's probably not just the idea that nothing has meaning. It's not the it's, meaning that it's, we ascribe but, to but it. But it's not that nothing has meaning. It's that because you can you can you can't read like Tale of Two Cities and be like, well, that was about aliens from Mars. <laughs> it's just that the the meaning in it is going to be accepted. it's going to it's going to awaken a certain meaning in people and maybe that meaning is limited but it's not the same for everyone i think is the idea of that <laughs> okay. uh, essay but i don't know <laughs> because it's written in like 1700s really archaic archaic prose. and smart language quote unquote <laughs> smart language smart language well all the writing that survived from the 1700s well from whenever onwards till like the 1900s is no, pretty much the smart no, language. Not really. Have you have you read any pamphlets from like the 1600s? Okay, well pamphlets <laughs> don't really count. I'm talking no, about like, <laughs> they served their writing and they survived. They pretty much count. <laughs> well, I said most anyway. I didn't say all. <clears throat> anyway, back to this story. The doctor's like, well, I guess we can give them all the corpses. I guess uh, we can give them all the benefit of the doubt, even though we have absolutely no proof except their word. Well, I guess the doctor feels bad because he, he was involved in the time war. And... No, I mean, I see I see where he's coming from. They don't actually bring this up in the episode about, like, trusting them. Well, they kind of do later, but... Yeah, I, I guess, like... I, hmm, I don't know, because I, I, I kind of want to say that I would trust them, too, if I was in the doctor's position, because, like... If you don't trust them and it turns out that they're telling the truth, you're going to be like, oh, shoot. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. So the doctor... I mean, if I was in the doctor's position, I'd just use my time travel powers to become incredibly wealthy. So <laughs> there's that. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> the doctor does the thing. He... Well, he finds the the rift. Gwyneth is yeah. like, don't I have a choice in this? And Rose is like, well, you don't understand. And yeah, Gwyneth's like, I know you think I'm stupid. Yeah, because Rose doesn't want Gwyneth to go through with being the medium. and Gwyneth, But Gwyneth reveals that she does want to and the doctor's not forcing her into it. Yeah, so Rose is like, maybe I shouldn't have judged you by your appearance, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so Gwyneth goes to the rift and she opens the rift and all the gelf starts streaming through and then uh predictably because there's still 15 minutes in the episode or some nonsense like that the gelf turn evil and they're like gonna kill everybody on earth because we have 10 billion gelf who need bodies yeah the doctor mentions like i thought you said there were only a few gelf left and they're like a few billion (laughs) the doctor's like wow see 
that's one of those things where it's like they weren't technically it, it they're not lying they're lying by omitting the truth <laughs> <clears throat> just weren't lying telling by the omission. Whole truth. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so it's not a straight outright lie. It's just uh, It's truth. It just wasn't facts. Yeah. I don't know. It just wasn't the whole truth. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, um, the doctor and Rose get locked in some sort of just little room that exists well, <laughs> in this catacomb. Well, okay, here's the thing. Here's why this scene was kind of weird and off putting is that the the Gelf inhabit the bodies of all the people because they're I don't think we mentioned but they go into the actual morgue room that's like sort of an underground area and they they inhabit the bodies and they they get up and they're sort of like zombies they're slowly walking towards the Doctor and Rose and the Doctor and Rose I think just head into this enclosed area yeah. when it seems like they could have just run up the stairs oh yeah I forgot to mention Sneed died yeah. and killed by one of his own corpses. corpses. <laughs> Kind of weird to phrase it that way, but yeah, it really felt like they could have just dodged, run up the stairs, and and gotten out of there. But instead, they just head into this sort of cage thing. Yeah. Well, my question was also, why does this just enclosed cage room exist in this mm. underground room? They got me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got me there. That's the architect when he was building it. Well, you got me there. They just told me to build it, so I did. <laughs> Apparently the Gelf completely ignore Dickens because he just runs away. He's the one who saves the day, though. He yeah. realizes that because the Gelf are gas, if you... Okay. If you turn <laughs> on the gas, they they get weakened and have to uh, come out of the bodies. Yeah, I don't really know how it works. Since, in theory, the room is already filled with gas, that gas just happens to be oxygen and hydrogen, which is what we breathe. But apparently filling it with, like, the gas they use to power the lamps forces the gelf out of the bodies, question mark? Well, it works, so you gotta give them that. (laughs) Well, yeah, in true doctor fashion, the plan that shouldn't work at all works. Yeah, because Dickens does that, and he's like, in theory, this should work, and the the Gelf start coming towards him, and he's like, please work. (laughs) And it does, so the Gelf are, like, streaming around in gas form, they can't inhabit any bodies. Rose is like, we gotta save Gwyneth. The Doc's like, don't worry, I'll save her. Yeah, just just going back a minute, the weird thing about Dickens returning and saving them was that he makes this big speech about what he's doing and how it's gonna save them, (laughs) but the Gelf sort of just kind of ignore him. (laughs) And don't really turn around for another minute. So that maybe, was kind of strange. Maybe it's supposed to be like... They're zombies and they're really slow. That's what I thought it was. Yeah, but maybe the the like grander purpose in the context of the Doctor is that it's supposed to be like, oh, the Doctor's this imposing figure and whenever he makes speeches, people listen. But when anybody else tries to do it, nobody pays attention. But everyone was paying attention to Charles Dickens uh, at this time and at the beginning of this episode, so... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, Gwyneth reveals that, for whatever reason, she says a box of matches in her pocket. Yeah. And the doctor tries to come up with a way to save her, but it's revealed that she's already dead. Yeah, um, she's already been dead for a while. And it's, they they don't explain it. They kind of just write it off. Like, there's... Because the whole thing about, with Charles is that he had to expand his worldview, and then at the end, the doctor... And, and it was kind of a nice touch that the doctor does have to expand his worldview too. So she sacrifices herself. Well, I, I guess because she's already dead. So I don't know how much of a sacrifice it really is, other than, other than just like a thing that you probably should do since you're already dead. But she explodes. Yeah, almost would have been more interesting if she wasn't already dead, and then the doctor lies to Rose that she's already dead. Because I mean, to me, it would have been keeping in line with that whole thing last week when. The doctor brutally murders Cassandra and is like, everybody has their time. Yeah, that would have been interesting, but I I still liked where they went with it. I, I liked the whole, well, the doctor doesn't really know everything either. Yeah, lying about it might have even been going too far, probably. Yeah, probably. Down that path. And obviously they don't want to do that, so. Yeah, <laughs> they kind of just walk back to the TARDIS with Dickens and he's like, do my books survive? Yeah, the doc's like, they survive forever. <laughs> I was like, nope, nobody remembers you. <laughs> this reminds me of a way better scene with the same concept with Van Gogh later. But anyway, we're huh. not there yet. We won't get there for another over a year, so. <sighs> yeah, then the 
Dickens decides that <laughs> the murderer in the mystery of Edwin Drood is going to be a blue specter <laughs> from space. Nice. Uh, thankfully, he doesn't write it because yeah, he dies. I didn't, I didn't but know, was is this a real book that he was going to write and is like his last unfinished book? Yeah, or it's something? a real book that that does exist that he didn't finish. And nobody knows who Dickens actually intended to be the murderer because he, huh. he didn't get to the part where the murderer is revealed. So he wrote Pretty like neat. half the book. So you can read half the book and you, and you can guess. There's a lot of literary theory about who people think was supposed to be the murderer based on like what Dickens had yeah. written and what Dickens t- spoke about during his time. But yeah, the book is unfinished and no one knows who the murderer was supposed to be. Nice. So yeah, when the doctor mentions that, oh yeah, Dickens will die in half a year. He'll never write the end of the book. That's true. Maybe he was never going to reveal the murder. Maybe he, maybe even if the book was finished, it wouldn't have been revealed. Well, that kind of would have sucked. <clears throat> but yeah, then they leave, and Dickens um, decides to make amends with his family. Yeah, his felt family. Kind of, felt kind of out of the blue, just bringing it up at the last minute. Like, this experience has really made me value my family. <laughs> the doctor's like, what about anything you've seen in the past eight hours has made you value your family? I don't even think it was eight hours. I think it was probably more like three because it only it takes place over one night and it's still dark um, when yeah. they leave. So maybe early morning. But that that was kind of my reaction. Like, what in this has made you value your family? But I guess it was just like, all right, this near death experience has made you want to value your family more, which was nice. So, yeah. And the fact that corpses can come back to life now. <laughs> Like, man, I'm not going to value my family at all. <laughs> Once they're dead, they'll be able to come back. So what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> Once they're dead, they'll come back to haunt me. So maybe I should just hurry it up a bit. <clears throat> yeah, overall, uh, probably the weakest of the reboots yeah, so far. Definitely. Well, out of the three so far. So Had some interesting ideas, in my opinion. But I think in the end of the day, it was just kind of paint by numbers. A lot of things in it were similar to previous Mark Gatiss things we've read or, or listened to. Yeah, wasn't necessarily bad. Yeah, the dial- I didn't like the, a lot of the dialogue because it felt like it was, wasn't was funny enough. Like the fan scene was like completely amiss to me. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, that's kind of a uh, pitfall of comedy, which is that not every joke is going to land for everybody and usually the jokes that do land for everybody are on the bare minimum of being <laughs> funny. You know, some people find some jokes, like, really funny, and some people will think the same joke's just not as funny. And yeah. To, uh, yeah. The fan dialogue just didn't land, but to some people it does. I guess. <laughs> I would assume. <laughs> also really played up the Dr. Rose relationship, so it's a start to that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it's coming. <sighs> Although it doesn't really take full force tall next year, so that's good. Yeah, Russell T does edit these scripts before they make it to screen, just to, I guess, make the dialogue just to put his name on it. No, no, no. <laughs> well, just to I mean, the... to make the dialogue more consistent. consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was the word I was looking for. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, otherwise, uh, that wraps up the unquiet dead. Yeah, preview for next time is that they go back to modern London. Yeah. Next Mickey's week. back. <laughs> Mickey's back. Next week, we actually have a two-part story. I don't know if we ever explained this recently. I don't think we did. We explained it like a year ago, but we're going to be doing two-part stories as one episode. So basically, in the reboot, we're doing each story gets its own which, episode. Which is exactly how we did the classic series. Yeah. It's just that most classic series episodes weren't just one episode. Actually, none of them were, unless you count, like, Mission to the Unknown. <laughs> yeah, and we did one episode yeah. on Mission to the Unknown. Yeah. Because it was aired between two stories that it had nothing to do with. No, it uh, it had to do with the Daleks' master plan. Yeah, but it, was, it didn't... It didn't air consecutively with yeah. that, but it yeah, had to it do with aired, it. It aired a serial before yeah. Dalek's Master Plan, so it didn't have anything yeah. to do with the stories on either side of it, is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of weird. Yeah. It anyway, is. yeah. Two-part story next week, so... Yeah. Extra-length episode, probably. Then maybe there'll be no plot and we can explain <laughs> it in ten minutes. Anyway, you can email us at thedoctor at decadervegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, your thoughts... 
on Mike Gatus. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Google Play, all at Trust Your Doctor. Leave a rating if you liked the show. Check us out on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter at DYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time we're watching uh, Aliens of London and World War Three. But until then, the end. <laughs>